Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for this live stream event. My name is Rebecca Karen and I am the event planner of the Microsoft Reactor New York. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review two items, our code of conduct and the event guidelines. Our code of conduct. Microsoft is dedicated to empowering every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more. This includes Microsoft Reactor events where we seek to provide a respectful, friendly, professional experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, physical appearance, disability, age, race, or religion. And we don't tolerate any behavior that's harassing or degrading to any individual in any form. So as individuals, we're responsible for knowing and abiding by these standards, and we encourage everyone to assist in creating a welcoming and safe environment. And that applies to this session as well. Please, you know, keep your commentary on topic. For event guidelines, um, this session is recorded. You will not be appearing in the video. You will be able to watch this on demand in just a few days on our YouTube channel. I'll share the link in the chat with you shortly for our YouTube channel. If you have questions, please submit your questions in the Q&A, which is at the top right of your screen. Um, we will be responding to some of those questions throughout, but also toward the end, we'll have some extra time. Um, please note that these sessions have a little bit of a lag because it is a live stream. There may be a little bit of delay. So if we you know, don't answer your question straight away, we will try to get to it as soon as possible. And also don't save your questions till the very end, because again, with that lag time, those questions might come in after the session's concluded. So make sure as they come up, you're asking them. And then finally, closed captioning is available. To turn it on, you can click on the CC or live caption icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. It'll be in English, Portuguese, or Spanish. So today's session will cover fundraising and institutional financing rounds. This event is part of a series of workshops uh, being promoted in partnership with IFC and Microsoft with the support of We Ventures and We Impact with the object objective of fostering women entrepreneurship. This event will be um, a conversation with panelists um, and again, an opportunity to ask questions. Today's panelists are Laura Lehman, founder of Maya Capital, Stevan Darling, an investment officer with the IFC, International Finance Corporation, and Marcella Siva, chief investment officer with We Ventures. If you've joined us in the past, you may recognize a couple of these panelists from previous sessions. Please do check out the series calendar, which I'll share in the chat as well, and check out future and upcoming sessions. At this time, I will switch over to our panelists and let them uh, take over. So whenever you all are ready, let me know. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having us. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Really happy to have you here, Marcella. Let's get Hi, Lada. Hi, Steve Vaughn. How are you? Hi, Marcella. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you also, um, Rebecca and, and the rest of the organizers for the for the invitation. I'm excited to share a little bit and, and um, also hear about hear your own insights. Sam, you're great to be connected today to, to share what we're seeing at the IFC. Good. We thought this would be, I don't know, a little more dynamic if we just talked to each other, asked each other questions, and then this way the audience would engage more. So did you guys bring questions? Are we ready? Who, who can we start with? I can start. <laughs> All right. Ladies first, obviously. Um, <laughs> so a lot of Back when you were when you and Monica were starting Maya Capital, I'm trying to make a parallel here. I understand that you were two young girls starting a business, fundraising in a very masculine environment, not unlike most of our entrepreneurs we see every day. 
Um, what would you say, what would you tell these entrepreneurs that want to start fundraising, that are women, that are young, that know that the market is very masculine? How did they, what are some good tips and advices for them to navigate this, this ecosystem? No, this is a great question. And it's definitely something that Monica and I had to deal with um, and continue to have to deal with actually we're also fundraising right now and, and it's a constant struggle. Um, not, not necessarily a struggle, but it's a constant extra validation that we have to go through. And so the main point of attention that I would that I would recommend here is one, make sure of make sure make sure make sure of what you're trying to build and, and of your conviction and trying to build this because more often than not investors especially investors that are maybe reacting to some kind of unconscious bias they will try to probably due to some kind of projection or something they'll try to understand they will understand your solution or or your proposal in in a different way than what you're saying so for example i i saw that a lot in in our case when we were raising our fund one we would go to fundraising meetings and we would say we're setting up Latin America's first early stage venture capital fund. Oh, OK, so it's a gender focused fund and we'd say, no, no, it's it's a venture fund. And they'd say, OK, so it's an impact fund. And we'd go, no, like it's just a venture fund and there's nothing wrong with gender gender focused funds. There's absolutely nothing wrong with impact funds. I actually think that Maya is very impactful in itself, but it was it was strange to them that two women out of nowhere had decided that not out of nowhere, but to them out of nowhere that had decided that we just wanted to set up something as plain vanilla as a venture capital fund. There had to be kind of some other angle to fit it into what they expected from us. So what I always tell women that are starting their fundraise is be sure that just have very clear kind of what you want because they will try to put you in a box. Um, so that's the first point. And then just if I may compliment here, there's lots of studies, right, that that kind of have tried to understand what it is for a woman to be fundraising. And the a really interesting one that was more recently published by the Harvard Business Review was a study on questions asked to female entrepreneurs versus male entrepreneurs. And the main conclusion to which they came is that female entrepreneurs, the questions that they most receive are um, prevention questions. So they're asked about their margins, they're asked about their sales, they're asked questions that make them be reactive and in some cases, or defensive, and in some cases may make them seem less visionary, while men are asked more questions that are more promotion questions. So they're asked about their sales, the market size, their growth, their vision, and this all makes them seem more, um, that they have a big, big, bigger vision and a better appetite for risk, which obviously in a, in a, in a context of fundraising puts the women in, in a much less favorable position. So just be prepared to answer these questions and they're great questions actually. So if you are, if somebody does ask you about your margins and your sales, answer that question and turn it around to demonstrate to them kind of your vision for for your growth and your vision for the market size and, and how you're going to use the margins and the sales that you've had more recently to really attain a relevant market share and that kind of thing. So just be very conscious that, that there will be unconscious biases. We all have unconscious biases and know how to react to them adequately. That's fantastic. Super insightful. Thank you. I think the, the only point that I would add to, to what Laura mentioned, because I, I think um, you know what she mentioned is, is is very spot on. I think one as in investors, it's um, partly our job to to ensure that we're trying to uncover any types of, of biases we we have, whether it's it's gender, whether it's it's uh, color, whether it's socioeconomic background. Um, I think um, on, on on the other side, um, when you know, I think about potentially what um, female founders can can do as as well in understanding that there is a, a number of bias in in the market. Um, I think um, oftentimes um, when you think of the venture business, it's it's one that is very much so based on relationship building, um, and I think. Um, 
for both men as well as women who are starting businesses um, today. Um, it's always important to start building those relationships before you're starting to, to fundraise. Um, and so I think um, for those who are listening today, if you know they, they have a roadmap of raising money in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, then it potentially would be very helpful for the entrepreneurs to start contacting their list of top five, 10 VCs in, in the market on an informal basis so that that would allow investors to have an opportunity to understand one, the founders as, as people, um, and also have a bit more leeway in understanding what the actual um, business is and, and what the metrics look like. Um, so I think that's, that's point one. And I think point point two is uh, it's important for, for us as investors to over time understand the importance of having diverse teams and the, the impact that has in terms of uh, profitability. Uh, I think there are similar amount of studies out there which show that diverse teams, both from a agenda perspective, as well as uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, a race perspective, they do perform better from a profitability basis, both at the, the fund stage, but also at the, the startup stage. Um, and I think, unfortunately, it's going to take some investors um, to see that number to start um, investing proactively in these diverse types of, of startups, um, but also it's going to take institutional investors as well who are demanding to see this change in the market. It's actually amazing that you started out with that because that was my first question to you. It was going to be, I wanted to understand, you're probably familiar with this data, but um, only we know that only 2% of global venture capital dollars went to women in the past few years. And when you look into black female founders, that's even less. It's like less than 0.1%. And it's just such alarming data. Um, and I want I wanted to understand from IFC standpoint, if you have any policies or recommendations, investment strategies in, in place to make sure that we can combat and address appropriately these issues. Yeah, so I mean, I think IFC is, is doing a number of, of things in, in order to, to bridge this gap, um, both from a agenda perspective, um, but also from a, a race perspective. I think from a gender um, perspective, there are, are two main programs that we recently developed. One is a, a program that not only focuses on the venture space, um, but throughout the, the capital structure is called REFI, um, which stands for Women in, in Finance, where IFC essentially allocates capital to both private equity funds as well as, as venture funds, which are predominantly um, women led. And, and also it, it airmarks capital to uh, entrepreneurs um, who are, are women or who are specifically focused on, on the female uh, population. I think secondly, beyond that, whenever we're investing in, in funds as an NLP, both on the private equity side, but also the, the venture side, uh, we are, are very proactive in, in terms of showing them what we believe um, a best in, in class um, VC fund or private equity fund looks like when it comes to, to gender uh, e equality. And we have a number of, of folks internally who would work with our fund managers to ensure that they are thinking about gender equality, they are thinking about um, race equality. So it's something that is very much so at, at the forefront of, of what we're, we're doing. Um, to, to, to make it a bit more specific, um, we're in the process of investing in a uh, Spanish speaking Latin American fund where about 40% of the, the capital for this fund manager is going to be focused on either startups that are, are led by, by women who have a predominantly um, woman management team or the board is predominantly um, woman led. And so what we are, are doing beyond just providing them with, with capital um, as their the anchor in investor, we're, we're also ensuring that we're putting them in the room so that they can get exposure to some of the, the first generation fund managers in, in other markets who have been able to, to scale much quicker and earlier than, than they have so that they can be able to have a certain level of, of mentorship if, if necessary. 
Um, and then also we're, we're helping to, to guide them to ensure that the structure of the fund becomes as institutional and professional as possible. So that when you enter conversations where folks may have that um, unconscious bias towards them, that is as eliminated and limited as much as possible because this, the fund would have already been working as a best in class institution. That's fantastic, Stevon. Thank you. Um, I don't know how you guys want to go about this. I have more questions for both of you. We have questions from the audience. How do you want to approach? If you let me, I'll just become a moderator and I'll stop speaking. So <laughs> what we what we do here. Um, do you have any questions? You want to read the questions from the audience? Let me know. I, I guess maybe maybe one question from 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 my side is. Um, uh, I guess, you know, Laura, you're probably, Maya Capital is probably one of the only um, VC funds in, in Latin America that is led by, by, by women. Um, I can only think of one other in, uh, in Colombia called uh, AWA Ventures. Um, at the same time, I would say probably less than 2% of all founders that come across my desk are um, women entrepreneurs. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, um, as you think about potentially other funds um, popping up who are predominantly um, women led, um, is there any advice that you would, would give them to, to help them um, potentially fast track uh, their fundraising process as you're now doing for your fund too? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a great question, Stevan. And just one point here. It's I I always I'm I'm super proud of this, but I think it demonstrates a little bit what happens when when women investors are are or when women are leading the investment team. So 40% of our portfolio has a female co-founder, or 40% of the companies in our portfolio have a female co-founder. So um, and and we don't have a filter for women. Obviously, it's something I I can't say if if the reason that our portfolio has more women is because we actively seek them out, if we have more access because we're women or because we understand different models that maybe our male counterparts wouldn't. I, I can't say it's probably a combination of all of them, um, but it just demonstrates what happens, right? If a woman is investing, obviously it, it makes sense that we will, women approach us probably, I mean, far, far more than like two percent of the of the deals that come across our portfolio, our our, our desk, are are women. I'd say it's much closer to thirty percent. When we talk about other other diversity, other points of diversity, especially race and and socioeconomic background, that's a completely different story. But in terms of women, um, we end up seeing quite a lot. And then in addition to that, there's the the analysis point that that I mentioned earlier. So we can. We can understand models like the Thea model, like the safe space model, that are that are models that are focused on women. For those of you that don't know, Thea is a um, is a platform for mothers or soon to be and early mothers, and and safe space is a platform for reporting um, misconduct in the workplace. Um, and these are exceptional teams, high growth companies that we really believe will will eventually be, become the big big bets in our portfolio um but maybe their models wouldn't have been understood by a team that's by an investment team that's only men so that's just one point that i wanted to punctuate that i think is is exciting to see and and so i do hope Stevan, to your question that we do see more women 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 investors one point here that maybe some an, an additional point of advice that i could give is so a VC, there's three priorities that a VC needs to be able to do really well, right? It's access the best deal flow, um, win these deals, so invest in these companies, and then add value to these companies once they're in the portfolio. And that, and they work in that order. So accessing the the deal flow is is going to be the first obstacle and is is probably the most important one because it's what allows for all of the other for the other two to happen. And that at the end of the day is network. So 
venture capital is a people, it's a network business and because of that, it's a people business. So for somebody that's thinking of starting a fund um, in whatever stage they, they may prefer, one of the main things is guaranteeing that you have a really strong network that will send you the best deals. And then once you have access to those deals, make sure that you can demonstrate that you have a value add that goes beyond just the capital. Because if you can't invest, because if these investors can't add value beyond just the, the dollars invested, um, then it doesn't make sense for either side to actually proceed with that investment. Yeah, I, I but always like something interesting. Sorry, oh, go ahead. So, but this is something interesting, and I don't know if, if both of you feel this also, but Monica and I, when we started Maya, I mean, my whole life I've been taught that the harder you work, the more success you get, right? So when we started Maya, that was it. Like, let's work really, really hard, and naturally, we'll get the best deals, we'll get access to the best deals, and naturally, the founders will see that we're the best partner for them. Um, and what we ended up realizing that is it's not that at all. It's being in the right place at the right time, having so going to that happy hour and connecting with the founder and being at that party and that kind of thing. And Monica and I are both introverted athletes, so we go to sleep early. <laughs> um, and we were never at the happy hour. We were never at the party. Um, so basically what we ended up doing is realizing we have to, we have to create our own, the, the VC ecosystem, it was a club and it was a club of kind of these men that had previously been in the ecosystem and we needed to create our own club. And, and I think we've been able to do that through a series of different things, networking, going very much outside of our comfort zones, um, going on runs with founders as opposed to going to the happy hour and, and the, fem the female force initiative, which we eventually started also. Um, so I think there's a series of different things that you can do to kind of really create a network that's proprietary, as they call it. Yeah, I completely agree. I would just add, I, I like to bring data to these things. Um, and first of all, congratulations on like building Maya from the ground up. I bet it was extremely hard and it, it probably still is, but it's amazing. We're huge fans. Um, but what I would just add data. I think we are still women investors. We are still very rare. That's that's the thing. So if we are only eight or nine percent of global investors um, and we have this specific point of view that we can absorb specific female oriented models, I still do believe that that's the main reason um, BC dollars end up not going to women and we end up not seeing as many women across our, our desks. Well, mine are obviously 100 percent, but across your desks. Um, and other than that, I really I really believe that um, women about, about the networking, it should be at the core, the center, the, the most important thing at the core of every every entrepreneur. And it's not a, it, it isn't it is indeed a club and that's something we're here trying to combat. We're trying to make this ecosystem more diverse, more open to other people, to other regions in Brazil, because in Brazil we only see investments in Sao Paulo and Rio and we're trying to make it, you know, a, a larger um, reach from the north to the south southern regions of Brazil. And networking is at the core of that because um, once you are open to diversity, you're open to people from all, all different kinds, sorts of backgrounds, you will be able to enrich your network. And what you said about um, moving out of your comfort zone is essential because we are always busy. We are women. We have kids. We run houses. We have our triple journey that we are all aware of. So we do have to make an extra effort to be present at events or whatever it is that wherever it is that people network at. And it is, we really need to understand the importance of that. And I think women sometimes miss it. We dismiss it as unimportant and it is not, it is, it is essential. It's good to hear you saying that and bringing word of that to the, to the entrepreneurs because it's absolutely essential. I still have a bunch of questions for you and I can start reading questions from the audience. If you guys are okay with that, if not, just interrupt me. Um, do you think women are in some way behind men when it comes to networking and getting the chance to pitch to investors? How should we overcome this? Well, I think you just covered this question, right? So you probably move on to the next one. We see that the north and northeast regions of Brazil holds a significant number of female entrepreneurs and most of them lack credit and financing. How can we close this regional gap and make sure make investors look at regions outside Sao Paulo? 
Well, I can start. I can start just real quickly saying how we came about to build our our um, public calls for startups that we ventures. We really, really want to make this as public and as diverse as possible and as welcoming as possible. So each and every um, call for startups we have is public. We invest in the verticals of, of our LPs and we make that public announcement through media, through our website, through social media, and we are literally open to um, registrations from anywhere in Brazil, literally all regions. So that was something that Microsoft created specifically to make sure that we could reach entrepreneurs um, from peripheries, marginalized entrepreneurs and those that are outside outside this Rio Sao Paulo axis. But yeah, Steve, when you had unmuted your, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think from, from, from my side, I think part of the geographic diversity in terms of venture capital financing is it's something that's not unique to Brazil, but it's something that we see across Latin America, across pretty much all the emerging markets where venture capital is pretty much just allocated to either the political or the financial capital. So here in, in Mexico, it's, it's very similar where the majority of the, the founders and the majority of the, the funds are, are based in, in Mexico City. Um, a similar trend in, in Argentina and a similar trend in, in, in Colombia. So I think that's the, 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 the first point. I think the, the second point is over time in some markets, we have seen that once a certain city becomes saturated with, with capital, investors naturally begin to, to look to other parts of the country or other parts of their region so that they can be able to find proprietary deal flow. So I do think that it's something that hopefully naturally will happen. Um, I think a second part of um, ensuring that venture capital financing is allocated to parts of Brazil that's not Sao Paulo, that's not Rio, that's potentially not um, Florinopolis is ensuring that the infrastructure is is also in, in, in place. And so, you know, when I talk about the infrastructure to, to create VC investing, it's one, ensuring that the education level outside of these main financial and local capitals is strong enough. Um, two, ensuring that there are strong incentives that state and city governments are putting in place to attract a startup to, to want to set up shop in, in, in their region. Um, and I think third, also ensuring that there is a, a strong opportunity for, for, for networking. Uh, I think the, the life of a founder is one that can be incredibly uh, lonely and having other startups, other entrepreneurs who you can easily get in, in touch with to share ideas and to, to work through various operational problems um, definitely helps to, to expedite the acceleration of, of, of an ecosystem. Um, and I think it really starts with there being one success story. Um, you, you look at what's happening in Colombia with Rappi. Um, they were able to become the first unicorn in that country, uh, which for a very long time did not have a, a lot of startups being developed. And then you had a number of senior executives from Rappi going on to develop their own businesses. You see the same thing in, in Brazil when you look at all of the, the unicorns that are being created. When folks have an exit either through an IPO or an M&A opportunity, they then either invest in other founders or folks who were part of their initial founding team go on and developing um, new businesses as, as, as well. So I think for me, really, it's one, ensuring that we create the infrastructure to ensure that the venture capital industry outside of Sao Paulo and Rio has an opportunity to, to thrive. And I think also a part of it is a, a natural progression as well, as there becomes more capital in these major cities and folks are going to naturally start to, to look for, for more opportunities to, to, to find all of them. Super great. Thank you, Stevan. Um, I have a couple questions here, one for Lara, one for Stevan. Let's start with Lara. You mentioned about the need to look for investees. Could you look, could you talk about the criteria that you use to select startups and financing rounds? Of course. 
Um, so first it's worth mentioning, especially on the point of bias, we've been speaking a lot about unconscious conscious and unconscious bias here. What we do is to try maximum maximally to eliminate these biases. So we have two processes in place. First is we ask all all founders that come through our pipeline to fill out a form. Um, anyone who's spoken to us, all founders who have spoken to us have probably filled out this form, so thank you. Um, all of you that will speak to us, you will fill out the form also. And basically it, it gives us a, a base of information that um, helps us kind of filter the the initial part of the of the pipeline um, and and avoid any any kind of unconscious or or even conscious opinions that we may have. The second point is we have a, a bit of a script that we follow for the first conversation and we make sure that we go through all of these questions with all of the founders in the first conversation and that eliminates the risk that we're asking questions that are targeted either to um, because of our own opinions on what we see at the other side of the table or in this in this time on the other side of the zoom or teams in this case um, uh, and and it just it, it also again helps us streamline and and avoid any any kind of m misunderstanding so that i just thought that that was worth mentioning in terms of what we look for in the forum and in our meetings it's three main things that we're always analyzing the first is team the second one is tam the the last one is product so in terms of team we're looking at we're looking for founders that are uh, obsessed with a problem in in the first place so we're making investments that are going to last probably 10 years, if not more, and we need to make sure that those founders are aligned as we are. So in order to align the founders, we, we or in order to make sure that these founders are are as aligned as we are, it's we basically look for, for teams that are speaking about a problem much more than the solution. Understanding that everything probably around around these founders will change except for them and the problem. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is we're looking for talent magnets. At the end of the day, a CEO and, and their, the, the executive team is only as strong as the team that they managed to build around them. So we're looking for people that can really attract talent, engage talent and align talent in the long run. And then finally, we're looking for founders with grit. We know that being an entrepreneur is not easy. Being an entrepreneur in Latin America is a whole different story. Um, so we just want to make sure that these are people that are going to don't aren't afraid of putting their hands in the dirt and really making sure that they're doing what's necessary to make these companies scale in the long run. In terms of market, we're basically looking, we try to understand what the size of the market is, who the players are. Uh, we look for strong or weak incumbents, strong benchmarks, and and we're basically just trying to understand kind of what what's the size that this company could become. And then finally, in terms of product, this is more of a last check that we do. It's more to understand whether the solution that this te the team is proposing makes sense given the context of the team and the market. Uh, if it could really be 10 times better than any alternative. So if there's really a strong moat, whether it's an aspirin versus a, a vitamin, those kinds of things. Um, and also kind of try to understand what the long term ambitions for the for the for the solution are. But in general terms, there's obviously much more behind the analysis, but in general terms, those are the three main points we're looking for. I don't know. I'm actually curious to hear Marcella Stevan if if that's aligned with with what you 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 seek. Yes, on our side, absolutely. We're definitely looking for strong teams, strong markets, strong products. We do have um, a different approach to the to it because we're most we're looking for women founders, so we necessarily need to see women in that cap table. Um, usually, if possible, with at least twenty percent of the cap table, or if not, with at least a perspective, a chance of um, acquiring more capital and, and becoming more relevant. We also require um, we need to see women in C level positions that actually have um, control and decisions of the company. We would not like to invest in. We really want to change the scenario of the two percent of venture dollars that get to women. So. Um, we wouldn't like to invest in companies that are um, that have women as investors, but not 
as executives. We really want to make those executives and those those um, investors both um, have access to capital. Um, other than the gender lens, we also look for companies that have at least some um, revenue. So at least I'd say around 200,000 highs in revenue. We are not currently looking at companies that are um, in ideation phase. We do have our first investment, which was We Impact, which is also a sponsor here for this um, workshop. And they are the ones who um, look into ideation phase and, and pre-seed phase. Um, and they, they have this fantastic value creation program that really helps um, entrepreneurs develop and reach a stage of maturity for investment by the fund. Um, also, in terms of product, we are very specific um, about our technology, having Microsoft as our main um, LP and also Flextronics. So we are very specific as to what kind of technology is used, what kind of solution they bring with that technology. We have a very um, curious eye for artificial intelligence. We we are um, always looking into hardware as well because of Flex. But yeah, I'd say that in terms of product, in addition to everything that, that Lara has said, we also have these um, specificities. What about you, Stevan? Yeah, I would say um, for IFC, given the fact that, you know, what we're doing on the, the VC side is a very small fraction of the $25 billion that IFC as an institution allocates on an annual basis, we're really trying to, to find startups that fit well with our late stage business. And so I, I think that the best way to think of, of us is uh, similar to a, a corporate venture arm of a large Fortune 500 company where we're the corporate venture arm of IFC. And so our goal is that we're investing in early stage companies today that hopefully in the next five to 10 years will be large enough so they will be eligible for late stage financing from the IFC, whether that's on the, the equity side or the, the debt side, which is the majority of, of where IFC um, focuses. So I think that that means we're focusing in, in probably call it four to, to five sectors. Um, one, um, in logistics and mobility, which is about a quarter of our global portfolio. So in Brazil, um, we invested in uh, two last mile delivery companies, one called Logi, the other is Ismandai. Um, we also are pretty big investors in, in health tech and have made a, a few investments in early stage clinics in both, mainly in Mexico uh, from a Latin American perspective. We, we look a lot at B2B SaaS and uh, B2B companies. Um, we also are very big investors in, in ed tech, agriculture um, technology, and then we also look at, at e-commerce. And then I think um, the, the biggest difference um, from where IFC is investing from where um, you two are investing is I think we're a bit um, later stage. Um, in, in the sense that um, we're really most comfortable at Series B and, and Series C um, stages of, of, of companies' life cycle, um, but we'll look at Series A on an opportunistic uh, basis. That's great. Thank you, Stevan. I think it was super clear. Um, and the audience, if you still have any questions on the criteria, please do let us know. Um, Oh, there's a question for all of us here. What should a startup look for in an investor? Um, I think Lada spoke a little bit about that already, but I, I can just start it off and then hand it over to you guys. Um, obviously, I think the market is currently over flooding with, with dollars, with money. So um, I don't think good projects, good teams will have a hard time um, accessing this capital. So if they are to look for something in an investor, they should definitely see, try to see what's what's in it for them other than the dollars, right? Other than the money per se. Um, as a gender lens investment fund, we're super aligned with ESG practices. So for example, um, we would also um, like advise um, startups to look for investors that are aligned with the principles of responsible investing, aligned with the uh, um, 
um, UN SDGs and whatever other metrics we can try to see to make sure that these um, you wouldn't want to align yourself with an investor that that's not aligned with your beliefs and with what you want your company to become, especially in this global market. Um, also, other uh, everything that we, for example, we are a multi corporate venture, so we we bring to the table um, all of our LPs with the point of view of the client really to to bring uh, to to develop and help develop a better comp a better products and something that will have a best fit with the market. That's the main cause of failure of startups is not having a good product market fit. So here we um, usually bring our LPs using the, the client standpoint to develop, help develop that product and make sure that when it hits the market, it will be um, the most appropriate um, one will have the best fit. So I think that, for example, when you see when you look at we ventures, you are you're looking at six different LPs of different backgrounds, large corporations bringing mentorships, executives, access not only to capital, but also to this um, help all throughout the journey of developing the, the best product with the best fit with the market. Um, also, I think I've seen lots of hardware companies that should also look for an investors alternatives for financing because we know that the um, um, acquisition of, of hardware isn't or an inventory isn't the best use of VC dollars. So I've seen some investors like ourselves that we try to bring also other creative, flexible um, financing alternatives for companies that um, have hardware and that don't necessarily that those solutions don't necessarily consume um, more of the equity of the entrepreneurs. Yeah, well, we're, we're, I would say you should look really for funds that are entrepreneur fo focused and really pro entrepreneur. Um, that's not hard to find, and it's definitely where you will find the best um, relationship. What about yourselves? I, I would say for for me, it's um, it's just a question because I think um, on on face value there are a number of entrepreneurs who would probably pick the fund manager who's going to give them the the best valuation, uh, which I, I you know obviously I'm biased because I'm um, investing in companies, but um, I think it's not always in um, a company's best interest to only look for for valuation. Um, I think based on what I have seen, um, the type of investor that is most helpful to startups really depend on the stage of, of the company. And I think also um, irrespective of the stage, companies should think about their investors as a portfolio. So think about investors in terms of, you know, if they need to have three or four different um, funds on their cap table, what are the different strengths and weaknesses that each of them are, are bringing to, to, to that company? Um, I think um, for me, there are probably three really important things that um, different funds can be helpful with. Um, and not every day do you have the same fund that can provide all of these value adds. I think for earlier stage companies, especially those who are first time fund managers, having someone who understands their local jurisdiction really well, who could potentially make an introduction to help them build up their founding team or make the, the first few hires of their executive team could be very helpful. Um, and maybe that's one type of investor that can do that for, for, for them. Um, I think secondly, um, having someone who has a bit of operational um, experience. Maybe that's a, a strategic, maybe that's a, a fund who has an operational partner. I think could be very helpful as um, fund managers are, are grappling with, with tough decisions, especially those who may not have a really strong network with more successful uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and then I think like the, the, the third, um, um, attribute or characteristic that I think is important, especially for Brazilian um, um, startups who will be thinking about expanding to other parts of, of Latin America or to the US is 
potentially having uh, a fund on, on their cap table who has experience investing outside of, of Brazil, who understands local culture in the markets where they're hoping to expand to so that they can be able to, to help bridge that gap as well. So I think those would be the, the top things on, on my mind. Can you hear me? Oh, OK, it's not OK. Um, so the only thing I would add, I, I totally agree with Stefan and, and Marcela. The only thing I would add is make sure to find an investor that recognizes that it's in their interest um, that that your six that so obviously your success is in their interest, but for them to but for you to be able to have the most flexibility and the most chances of of succeeding, there needs to be a lot of flexibility on their side. So at the end of the day, I think what I'm trying to say is make sure that these investors are aligned with you, not only for this round, but also in the long in the long term. And the best way to validate that is speaking to their portfolio companies. So we always say, I mean, we're diligencing the companies, we're analyzing the companies that we're investing in. It's only fair that these companies do the same with us because they're also entering into this long-term relationship. So speak to the speak to the founders in, in, in these, these funds portfolios, try to understand how they added value, try to understand how their interactions are, make sure that these are people that you want to spend time with, a lot of time with, for at least the next five years and maybe more. Because that's probably what's going to happen. That's very true, very true. Um, yeah, thank you for the responses. We still have more questions here from the audience. Do you consider ESG standards as criteria in investment rounds? How do you see this relationship between the ESG trend and the mainstream investment criteria? Do you guys want to start? Do you want me to start? How do you want to go? That seems like a very IFC specific question. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to start there. Um, so I mean, I think from, from the point of view of, of IFC, for all of our in investments, um, once we've made a decision that this company can, you know, hopefully grow to be a, a unicorn now a valuation uh, above a billion dollars. The, the other two questions that we ask ourselves would be one, what's the role of IFC? So do we have a place to, to add value? Um, and then the second is what's the level of developmental um, impact? Um, I think oftentimes when we think about developmental impact, um, it's you know on the basic level for investing in a health tech company, then these you know, company is going to save X lives going forward. If we're investing in an ed tech company, then this company would be able to um, train X amount of, of students to, to make them more productive citizens. Um, the, the other part about developmental impact is in ensuring that our investments aren't doing harm to the environment as, as well. And so IFC has an environmental and, and social responsibility um, team that, that goes into quite a bit of, of detail for all of our in investments. But the main goal of understanding, one, do these companies have a current ENS policy in, in place? Um, if they do, are there any gaps? If they don't, then how can IFC help them to be able to, to put together standards that are as universally acceptable as possible? So that's one, looking at their HR policies to, to make sure that they have the proper treatment of, of their employees. Um, I think this is an especially um, touchy topic when it comes to the on-demand e economy where you have you know, tons of lawsuits, not just in Brazil, but in other markets as well, um, when it comes to the treatment of independent drivers. So ensuring that there's some type of policy there as well to, to, to minimize um, these risks uh, going forward. Um, and, and I think, one, it's the right thing to do when we think about ensuring that we have as minimal adverse impact on the environment as, as possible. Um, but also I think is important because, you know, one thing that we're trying to do when we're making investments is try to figure out um, what's the most absolute downside um, that can happen. And a big part of that as well is legal 
risking and liabilities. And so if we, we get the ENS right, then hopefully we can also be able to, to minimize um, legal liabilities going forward as well. Yeah, thank you, Steve. On that was that was amazing. Um, we we actually here at We Ventures, we when we were we still are, but when we were first building our investment criteria, we did have a few conference calls with the IFC specialists to make sure that we know how to implement ESG metrics not only in our analysis and our risk analysis because we strongly agree, believe that that's absolutely necessary nowadays. It's not even a matter of wanting to do it anymore or not. It's just um, you have to. It's kind of fiduciary duty, but also to understand um, how to do that, how to do that and not be um, imposing on the companies at the same time, um, directing them in the course that is correct and not um, being a burden. So we did have great sessions with IFC experts um, to to come up with them with K KPIs and metrics, and we basically um, made them around the um, UN SDGs. So we take a look at all the SDGs that are uh, that the fund is aligned with. Obviously, gender equality being the main one, but all other ones as well. And we try to see and apply into the businesses of each each one of the prospective um, investee companies. We try to see how do they align with each of these SDGs, and if if they don't, how can we help them um, to to become aligned with the SDGs? So that's basically um, the main um, route we're to, we're taking lately, um, based on our conversations with IFC experts, to which we're super grateful. Lada, do you want to add something? Can you hear me? Yep. Now Sorry, you the, the platform is a little slow for me. Um, so on our end, we don't explicitly have ex as yeah, any ESG metrics that we measure or that we require our teams to measure. Um, what we've been considering more recently is actually so. So first, we don't measure them because mainly the stage that we're investing in which is in the very early stage we think it's risky even to have to establish these these limits as to in a certain way and two because we invest in we believe that we're investing in teams that are solving the region's most relevant problems and we like investing in teams that are solving problems because when we're looking at kind of those three things that we look at the markets the largest markets that we see are really behind these problem opportunities so we would never invest in a company, for example, that we don't see that isn't solving something, a relevant pain to the population, mostly because we don't see business opportunities there. Um, so that's one point. And the second thing that we've been considering, we've seen this a lot um, around, especially in the US and, and something we've been considering and it's something I'd love to hear your insights on is the positive term sheet. So making sure that in, a, so in addition to our term sheet, which obviously establishes all of the terms of the round, Having a more having a, a term sheet that establishes more key expectations in terms of values and behavior from the founding team. So just making sure that the team has a posture, even in the at the end, towards I guess society and towards their own team that is aligned with Maya's value values. Um, it's something that we've seen a lot of funds in the U.S. starting to do. And it's something that entices us because we are we are all mission driven at Maya, and, and we all hope, we all believe that we're our long term goal is to change Latin America by through entrepreneurship. So um, it's very it's it's something that that is exciting to us, but we we haven't had the courage yet to do it. And I'm curious to hear if you've all seen anything similar. I, I, I haven't seen anything similar, at least not in, in, in Latin America, where um, I focus all of, of my time. But um, I think it's a very interesting proposition. I, I, I find a lot of parallels with, you know, call it um, hedge funds and other public equity uh, market investors who have essentially, you know, put out rules in terms of investing in you know, oil and gas or coal projects. Um, because I think that there 
as a segment of the, the market in terms of, of companies, be it startups or, you know, late stage um, businesses where the founders or the executive management team wants to do what is right in terms of ESG or wants to do what is right in terms of ensuring that the culture at their, their the businesses is um, as appealing or attractive as possible. And I think there's also um, another segment of the, the population who may not care or may not be aware of how their actions from a, a culture standpoint or an ESG standpoint, they um, impact profits going forward or impact the, the morale of, of their in employee base. Um, and I, I think while um, it's always important to have a fine line between mandating the companies do something um, versus allowing them to, to opt in. I do think that in certain situations, certain scenarios, as, as investors, um, we may need to find a way to have a bit more of a heavy hand in the things that are most important to, to us. Um, and if the thing that's most important to us, you know, is through that positive term sheet for, for culture and, and different values. I think that's important because I think at the end of the day, um, the companies we invest in are extensions of who we are as a fund manager. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I haven't seen the positive term sheet in Brazil as well, especially being a fund organized in Brazil and subject to Brazilian law, um, such as We Ventures and also other um, colleague funds we, we know of. We have very specific regulations that our term sheets are, are a lot different from yours, really. And it's just kind of a light at the end of the tunnel to think that maybe you guys will start bringing this into Brazil, especially since we have this um, very gender oriented, um, diversity oriented lens in our investments, it would definitely be fantastic to see this trend um, finally getting here. And maybe, who knows, we would be able to make some changes in the way we do business here. Um, definitely, definitely would be great. Um, we have literally three minutes to go. I would like to ask one final question that came to me a while ago. Do you guys have any other questions? If not, I'll just pop in. Are you good to go? OK, um, I've been seeing lately lots of female founders, female founders that have like 75 percent or more of their cap tables um, come to meetings with us, bringing male advisors, senior advisors and to every meeting they never have a meeting alone with us and do you, do you what do you think about the imposter syndrome i've uh, we've obviously read about it many times but i've read it both ways i've read it that it it is a thing and it's not a thing so what do you lada as a woman and what do you Stephen, as a male investor what do you think of that and have you have you ever seen that and observe women fundraising or, or having conversations with funds bringing male advisors Whereas I've never seen a male founder bring any advisors to, to these conversations. So I, I want to see your take on this. You need to come spend some time with us at Maya. We see all kinds of crazy things. Some Someone recently brought their their coach to the meeting. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Just, and and <laughs> one time it was also, it was like, their, it wasn't their therapist, but it was like a therapist role. It was interesting, oh my but God. it's fun, it was a lot of fun. Nowadays in Zoom, it's it's less it's less we see less of the the dynamics, but in person you see a lot of the person dynamics. It's a, we have a lot of fun. Um, on this, I mean, yeah, I I think imposter syndrome is a thing. I, I recently saw a study actually of investors. So I'm I'm a part of a, a the Kaufman program, which is a an investor program, um, and they did a study on the first day. They did a, a poll actually, and it was like 97% of the people there supposedly among the most promising up and coming investors in the world it, around the world 97 percent of them have imposter syndrome so um i think it's some i i understand it even in in women founders and what we see isn't necessarily that it's it, the imposter syndrome what we see is the manifestation of it in kind of being less courageous and less aggressive in terms of vision 
So we, we at Maya struggle with that, even kind of being able to really communicate in an, in an adequate way, kind of the size of what we want to build in the long term. And that's something that comes much more naturally to people who have been told their whole life that they're capable of anything and everything, right? Um, so I think it's much more that just be in Portuguese. There's a great expression, be um, pau, be audacious and and be courageous and and kind of believe in in the dream that that you you want to build and and make sure that the other side understands that. Yeah, I would say from 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 my side. So, um, and, and I think probably you know I haven't seen this because I'm investing a bit later, and so the entrepreneurs who come to me have already been vetted from you know folks who are at the seed or Series A stage, and so hopefully at that point they um, have less of a in in, in imposter um, syndrome. Um, but, I, but I think of of ways of you know how to potentially overcome that going forward for, for any group um, that may be in the minority in terms of VC investing or the entrepreneurial side. Um, I think this is one of the areas where having a strong mentor or a strong group of mentors can can be very um, helpful. So finding folks who are successful in your field, in, in your sector, um, who can help guide you and give you a seat at the, the table um, and encourage you so that you can feel that you are, have earned what you have achieved so, so far. Um, and I think also something that has worked um, really well, because I think you know we all feel this from time to time is you know, having accountability uh, buddies, so so to speak. So someone who is a bit more of a, a peer who either may also have similar um, fears of, of self-doubt or someone who may not experience that at all, um, but who may be able to very quickly capture when we are expressing those types of, of characteristics. Um, and if we were to be able to have that accountability person who um, essentially calls us out either on a spot or in a private meeting, I think um, that will allow um, folks around the table to, to understand when they're moving into these um, types of characteristics. It could be a bit more aware of it because I think for the most part, it's, it's very unconscious. So I'll give you my two pieces of uh, advice. Awesome. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Just give me one second and I will. It just happens to be on another slide deck, so just bear with me one second here. while I pull this up. So we have another upcoming series uh, session on June 30th. That one is in Portuguese. Um, the It'll be an in impact investing. Impact. How to call it in, how to get the attention of those investors. Yeah, but it'll still be a very, you know, if you're tuning in and you don't happen to speak Portuguese, it'll you can um, enjoy it in closed captions. We'll have that uh, be translated also for Spanish. Um, so if interested, definitely check it out. I've shared the um, series page link in the uh, in the sessions chat so do click on that follow through you'll be able to see past sessions that we've already hosted um, on demand and future sessions coming up uh, both featured in english and in portuguese and then we also have on july 14th another session coming up so definitely um, thank you marcella stevan lara this was great really appreciate um you taking the time and presenting and discussing with us um happy to have this continued series and we look forward to the future thank you so much for the invitation thank, thank you. you thank you for having us oh. yeah. thank you everyone thank you have a good rest of your day
take care.